Well, welcome everybody to Chester Arnold's studio tour uh, regarding his current exhibition at the Fresno Art Museum, Reports to the Contrary. And we'd ask that everyone keep their uh, audio on mute unless you need to speak and, and you will have an opportunity to ask questions at the end. You can also, you're welcome to put any comments or questions in the chat and questions we will read at the end after Chester finishes his tour. Um, you are being recorded and there will be a recording available in a couple of weeks. And with that, I think that covers all the housekeeping and I'm going to turn it over to Michelle Ellis Pracy, our director and the curator of this exhibition. Thank you, Susan. Hello, everyone. I am Michelle Ellis Tracy, and I'm the curator of Chester Arnold's exhibition at the Fresno Art Museum and the executive director and chief curator of the Fresno Art Museum. Thank you for being with us today for the live studio visit to Northern California painter Chester Arnold, whose work is now on exhibition at FAM. After this introduction, Chester will be joining us from his Sonoma, California studio. Chester Arnold's retrospective at the Fresno Art Museum opened two weekends ago on February 5th. Entitled Reports to the Contrary, A Persistent Vision, it spans the years 1971, when he was 19 years old, through 2021, and includes 20 master painter paintings and another 20 small and miniature works. We also included sketchbooks from each decade that are open in exhibition cases and some bronzes that he cast in the 1980s. I invited Chester Arnold to exhibit at FAM several years ago, but because the pandemic wreaked havoc with our set yearly exhibition schedule, his show was bumped forward to this period of time. So beginning last May, he and I verbally and visually explored the potential focus of this solo show, and we decided on a retrospective. His first, but we anticipate, not his last. We spent hours emailing and meeting by Zoom to distill the exhibited works from hundreds of paintings he had created over the last 50 years. Almost all of the 40 pieces in this retrospective are borrowed from private collections throughout California. Until Chester visited his exhibition on opening day, he had not seen certain paintings in this show since he painted them and they were sold 35 or 40 years ago. His collectors have told me wonderful stories of owning Chester's paintings and how Chester's work affects them every single day, whether hanging over their bed, in their living and dining rooms, or entry halls. Many have said they are taking this opportunity to finally paint their walls now that their paintings are on loan for a nearly six month period of time. Mm -hmm. When you visit the museum, the exhibition is hung in chronological order because it is a retrospective and divided by decade with texts written by the artist, demarcating each of the five 10 year periods. An obvious and powerful persistent vision is revealed as you travel the years with Chester from 1971 through 2021, studying painting to painting. In addition, QR codes are placed next to certain works so that you can shoot that code with your phone and expanded text written by Chester are revealed on your phone. So you have even more insight into the painting that you are looking at. So Chester's exhibition fills the lobby, all of the concourse, hallway spaces, and it ends in the very back. Uh, and you're looking down to the back right now. This is a major painting, 72 by 80 something. And this is the final painting in the exhibition that he painted expressly for us. It is called Tomorrow. And I'm sure you can see why as we look through this broken open brick wall skyward. Who knows what is waiting for us 
And this is an example of some of the small paintings in the exhibition, which are as masterful as the gigantic pieces. And now for some background on the artist, Chester Arnold was born in Santa Monica, California in 1952. This is his mother on the left holding Chester and his father on the right. From the age of five, he lived and attended school in Munich, Germany, where his father, a linguist and field agent, worked for the US intelligence service. His education included exposure to the great museums pictured here of Munich and Vienna that shaped a belief in the power of painting to communicate beyond words, a power that he has pursued ever since. The next few slides, uh, Chester graduated from the San Francisco Art Institute, pictured here in 1988, and began a fruitful teaching career paralleling and supporting his studio practice in classes taught at his alma mater, San Francisco State University, and retiring a few years ago as a senior fine arts faculty member at the College of Marin in Kenfield, California. This is a wonderful photograph on the left of Chester as a 19 year old, pulling uh, his poster from a lithographic stone of his very first exhibition at the Marin County Library. So on the left is Chester pulling his print and on the right is the poster. And Chester pointed out to me that it is exactly 50 years because this first show was in March of 1971 and his retrospective, the second month of which will be in March, 2021. So it's very cool. Mm -hmm. These paintings are both in the exhibition. The one on the left is a self-portrait done in 1973, letters from New York. And when we decided this would be a retrospective, he painted a miniature painting mirroring the composition on the left with himself today. And both of these pieces are in the exhibition. And this is Chester back in 1977 on the left. He is visiting Versailles and Chester today. Arnold has widely exhibited nationally. His paintings are in too numerous to count private collections, thank goodness and the public collections at the San Francisco MoMA, San Jose Museum of Art, the Rosa Center for Contemporary Art, among others. And if you're in the city and visiting galleries in the Potrero Hill District, he's been represented by the Catherine Clark Gallery there since 2003. In anticipation of visiting FAM to see this exhibition or returning to see it again, which we hope you will, I will read a quote from one of the artist's previous catalogs and written by my colleague, Karen Kinzel, director of the Palo Alto Cultural Center. And this is the painting, Reports to the Contrary, which was the inspiration for the title of his ex exhibition. Karen writes, Chester Arnold's paintings unfold instead of confront. Meaning and beauty reveal themselves in layers, rewarding prolonged viewing and careful consideration. His layers of narrative, composition, and meaning contribute to the intensity of his work. We find ourselves returning to his paintings as we do a favorite poem or novel, gaining new insights and fresh ideas with each viewing. And the perfect segue to meeting Chester in his studio are these words written by him. Living provides us with countless opportunities to engage with what exists around us and even beyond us. Of the many options explored in a life of nearly 70 years, painting and drawing have been means to unknowable ends. And as we, as I introduced Chester in his studio to you, I thought I'd give you a photograph of his palette. <laughs> that he describes, these are, this palette is the beginning, beginning of his physical paintings, even though his imagination and his mind are the beginning of the paintings truly. But he describes his palette as a geology of choices, colors built on colors on a tabletop, finding inspiration. It is a playground, an excavation, a landscape of pigmented strata, 
and the combinations still present surprises 50 years on. And with this introduction, I introduce you to Chester Arnold in his studio. Welcome, Chester. Thank you. Um, thank you for the more than generous introduction. I'm a, I'm a little bit sunburned by the approbation. Um, and this whole process for me of, of having a show that encompasses 50 years has been uh, a journey through time and a journey through emotion. And um, I thank Michelle and the museum for allowing me to do this. And for all the people that have loaned work to, to have these things together again for the first time in a very, very long time. And as Michelle said, it's, an, it's a rare opportunity for any artist to be able to see their work, especially a retrospective of their work and really consider honestly what they have accomplished or not looking back through the time. So um, it, it is, it's a wonderful, it has been a wonderful and sobering experience for me. And I, I hope that uh, people that come to, to see the work will be um, energized by it in some way. Um, so I'm sitting in my studio where a large proportion of the works that are at the museum now have, have been made over the last 30 years. Um, so I thought I would start my tour of the studio by doing a, a kind of a 360 vi tour with the camera and I'll swing around at the, probably the largest painting in the studio right now, which was done in 2011. And what didn't make it into the show because it was one of those paintings that was so large. Um, but to make paintings that are eight feet across and seven feet high in a studio that has a doorway that's uh, seven feet tall is a little bit of a challenge. And I sometimes wonder um, why I even attempted to, to do it. But uh, along the course of this little tour of the studio, maybe I can touch on some of those reasons. Um, this is a painting that started out as a, a kind of a recollection of, of all the paintings that I could remember and cared about that were in and around my studio. And, and like so much of the work that you're gonna be seeing in the studio here and in the show was created from memories, not from actually looking at the things uh, because probably one of the most important aspects of making art that worked for me that I discovered along the way about halfway through my career was that I found much more meaning arising in, in the articulation and execution of images from memory than from actuality. Uh, uh, it was, and I'll move the camera around here a little bit to, to show some of the other stacks. Um, as you look around the room, you see stacks of paintings everywhere. You see materials that are used to make them. Um, uh, there is a, the current version of the palette with, which is rather chaotic as all, are, are all the materials that surround the palette. But like so much that seems chaotic, I'm always saying to people that come to see and ask me how I can possibly maintain a sense of organization. Uh, when you spend so much time doing this um, in the space, it's remarkable how familiar you become with it so that I can tell uh, whichever color is still wet. And in fact, I've said that if there is color that's dry on my palette, then I haven't been painting enough. Uh, because uh, it should still be wet and, and on the in an ideal world of course as I envisioned it 50 years ago I would be painting every day for the next 50 years lo and behold I've missed a few weeks a few days along the way but um, when I see the piles of things that I've made and uh, there, it has it's been a, a long and very fruitful association and conversation with the art of painting as I've as I've found it to be um, so the, what I'm surrounding you with here now is my little workspace and on my easel uh, is a drawing from about the time, the earliest time in the studio. Um, uh, this is bef actually made before I was, obviously before I was married and before I lived in Sonoma. But as an example to kind of take you through a quick journey through the development of an artist's career in mind, uh, this is a drawing that was kind of, uh, it was drawn from life at a time as a student when one was figuring out how everything in the world looked and how those things could be articulated without the foggiest idea of why I was doing this. All, all I can say is that at the time, my association with friends uh, and teachers 
had inspired my enthusiasm for study and practice to such a degree that I had, uh, I was extremely motivated and spent many, many more hours even than I do now drawing and painting desperately thinking that this was, this had a value uh, beyond the, just the practice of the moment, but was building uh, a, a language that could be used because it seemed as though um, I felt that I had something to say, something to tell the world. So uh, this word, this sort of sets a standard. And if you look through the paintings uh, in, the, in the museum, I have a feeling you're gonna find several <laughs> iterations of boots and shoes that follow their, their DNA goes back directly to these studies that were done in college uh, as, as an 18 and 19 year old student. So uh, I look upon them as the downloading of the world as, as visual language to serve the interests of the imaginative world that then grew uh, out of that. So in that same vein, I have here a, um, a pile of little uh, drawings that are done on paper. Some of these, sometimes these occur in sketchbooks, sometimes they're tipped in. Uh, but these are little stacks of uh, a really nice quality paper and they have little sketches in them. Sometimes they become something and sometimes they don't. They're the size of a business card and sometimes they're drawn on as this one is on both sides. I don't even remember oftentimes when they were made. Sometimes they're not dated. There's a strange little face. Um, but I find that uh, so many of them are made following the course of, of a, a series of days or weeks that uh, they end up surprising me with uh, subject matters that connect sooner or later in along the mainstream of what I'm doing. And then here's, a, here's a, one of the little pieces of paper that's coated with a gray ground gesso. Uh, now this is, here's a good example of elements of na na the natural world and elements of figures that might have been taken from down downloads from figure drawing or figure painting from 40 or 50 years ago, uh, but ends up being a little sketch exploring an idea. What are these people doing surrounding this tree? I'm not exactly sure. And maybe that's why it's still a sketch and not a painting. And here, oh, here's a, and amongst those is a talk about a miniature a very miniature self-portrait um, done in when is it 2015? Um, watercolor on paper. So anyway, there's there these are like a stack of cards and they're they're figures, they're things in them that this is kind of like an archive that I re return to again and again um, when I feel like I'm searching for a connection. And it's been a very, very fruitful as with sketchbooks, a very fruitful archive, archiving of imagination and memory. So on occasion, I still do paint things from life. Uh, if I am moved to, I mean, I don't want to feel, make it seem like I'm uh, so rigid in my practice that that can't happen. And as a result, I will sometimes do a self-portrait from life or a, a study of an object. Well, somewhere I have an example here of a a painting of a crab that I did recently working on a project with a friend. And this is an example of something that was painted in a, an hour and a half or so of a, a study of, a, of an actual Dungeness crab. And anybody that is a Dungeness crab eating in the audience will sort of understand the affection and delight that one takes in looking at the crab, but then actually eating the crab uh, which is a large part of the, the circle of life and, and the completion of, of the pleasures of observing and uh, making a painting of it. Uh, so as you look at the wall behind my easel, you'll see a number of things on the wall. And I can't really zoom in on them with my, the camera of my, uh, on my pad here. But there are works by several friends of mine uh, that I move around from time to time and I find inspiration and in oftentimes late at night, just as, as most people do that have paintings hanging in their space, living spaces, who we'll connect with certain images for certain reasons at different times. And on the wall I have, uh, as I'm looking at the screen, um, moving from uh, left to right or right to left, I have a drawing by my dear friend, Pierre Flandreau, a painting by, my friend John Sloan of an abstraction of a circle. 
uh, a beautiful landscape painted by my friend uh, Julian Bell, who lives in East Sussex in, in the UK, um, a painting that I just acquired in the last year and I'm just in, enjoying it so much having it there. And then across there's a, a small little nude of a woman taking a shower done by my wife, Frances. And uh, it's one of my favorite little paintings in the studio. Um, it's, there, it's, it's so pure and luminous in its character. Uh, so these are parts of my life, despite uh, alongside my own practice that fill me. And I wanted to say a few words about that, of how the importance of, of friends and associates uh, that we're, we're so fortunate to have. And perhaps uh, the, the Zoom has allowed people a, a greater degree of intimacy and connection with their own friends, strangely enough, during the COVID times. Because uh, I can't imagine, I can't remember the last time I had people visiting the studio um, like this, uh, partly because it's a fairly small space and it doesn't like more than maybe three or four people in here at a time, just for, uh, so otherwise people will leave with paint on their, on their, the backs of their sleeves. Um, so in the course of ma making work from, from the earliest times onward, um, I, I've, I've followed many threads and painted many things. And about halfway through, uh, towards the end of the 1970s, after spending a couple of years actually painting out of doors, uh, I found that it just felt important that I get back into the studio to work. Uh, ideas began to surface constantly that were being sketched and really wanted to be explored on a larger format. So in, in the late 70s and the early 80s, I really began to paint in earnest from uh, following the, the, the memories that I was having. And I have to confess, one of the great inspirations that time was the great Philip Gustin retrospective at the San Francisco Museum of Modern Art, which strangely everybody was talking about as objectivity or representation and narrative being reborn. And I've always, I've always found that an amusing not notion that, uh, that somehow painting had died, or as, you've, as you may have read or heard over the decades, if you're old enough to have heard it, um, various critics saying that painting wasn't gonna be possible anymore, that it was dead. And I always just found that a ludicrous statement simply because when I looked around me, just as I did, as I did then and as I do now, there were people painting everywhere, uh, shows of paintings everywhere. I found in my classes, people, legions of people wanting to learn to paint because they all had something to say. And by becoming a part of that conversation, a visual conversation, it may not have been visible at the highest levels of uh, the big museums in New York or, or Los Angeles or even San Francisco, but painting has, has been alive every moment, I think, of human civilization somewhere on earth for the last 50 years, even 100,000 years, if you think of cave paintings, the earliest cave paintings and so on. Um, so the, the idea that uh, painting, and, and I loved returning to it because it, it appeals to my sense of stubborn uh, resistance, the idea that painting was dead was going to be disproven by my sheer effort to uh, make paintings that were so big and so powerful in some way that uh, the statement would be made and it would put to end the, the notion that painting was dead. So hence the, the, the title of the show, Reports to the Contrary, it really was part of that idea that no matter what anybody said about the relevance of painting in the Western canon, uh, its relation to conceptual art or, or installation art or other forms of art that have grown around it, rather than being, uh, a stepchild of, of any of those other forms. It's just another thing that runs on parallel tracks. And I've used that metaphor as a, as a way of describing the liberation of painting and away from all of those, um, excuse me if I move this a little bit, uh, the liberation of painting from uh, the, the kind of the critical, the critical narrowing of its possibilities into a world in which everything can happen and it is happening all the time, even in the digital world. I mean, I used to worry when I began teaching that I, I could, would see people uh, beginning to work with uh, painting programs on their computers. 
and they seemed so excited about it. But I thought, well, this is this could be of some use only as a preparatory tool uh, for the eventual making of a painting, which has its own uh, special characteristics. And I could probably talk for several days or weeks about the special qualities that painting has for me, um, the, the tactile sculptural quality that paint has to, uh, as, it's, as it's imparted onto the surface, no matter what it's describing or not describing, uh, whether abstract paint, abstract or representational, whether uh, Jackson Pollock or whether Jan van Eyck, the virtues and beauty of those things when we get close enough to them is has for me been a source of tremendous satisfaction, edification, uh, and soulful deepening. Um, and also, there's something to be said for the fun of it, uh, the, the actual fun of making making work, which takes me to my drawing table here, uh, which is usually much more uh, buried in debris than you see it here. But on this table are a few current projects. One is a small painting which was just done a few days ago, one late one night, and that is called, uh, I called this the Slob's Homage to Wayne Thiebaud. And as an admirer of Wayne Thiebaud's work, but finding it impossible to use the kind of clarity and brilliance of palette that Wayne Thiebaud used, and at the same time feeling a tremendous affection for the material that's in front of us three times a day on the plate, uh, I found that this is a subject that I'm not going to fear anymore to, to uh, make paintings of. So it's a, a little bit more visceral, a little bit more juicy and messy, crumbs included. Um, and so this is on, on my uh, studio table right now, along with the sketchbook that generated some of the ideas for these things. So you'll see there's a there's an image of a crab, there's a half-eaten sandwich, some potatoes, um, there's a turkey leg. These are paintings that haven't all been made yet and uh, quite a bit of, oh, there's a TV dinner. Well, uh, there's, there's a, a rusty memory because I haven't had a TV dinner since I was probably eight years old. I don't even know if they're made anymore, but in recalling them, uh, I found that, that that's a subject that might be developed into, uh, into a painting as well. I don't know. So we follow these things from day to day. What did I say about Rocco, my grandson? There is a little sketch of his, his face right there, actually. Uh, I hadn't had the courage to paint him yet. So anyway, there, uh, there are dozens and dozens of sketchbooks like this, in addition to the little pieces that I showed you earlier. Certain ones um, end up becoming icons for a period for me. I'll show you one of my absolute favorites, and that is uh, this little watercolor from 2012. And it, the, the inscription at the top of it says, the eye of the mind is a drone beyond time and space. Uh, and as everybody is talking and looking at drones irritatingly, sometimes at the beach, uh, you're sitting there looking out at the water and you hear a buzz above your head and you realize it's a drone and I just swear. However, the internal eye that is of the mind, it's the eye that takes us on journeys in our dream world, uh, can really take us with practice to anywhere that the mind is, is willing to go. And that sometimes requires a certain kind of risk at turns being a, a, a little bit careless or even a little bit crazy by some definitions in order to discover territories that have not been seen yet. So uh, this, this has a sort of a William Wiley-esque uh, character, the, the eyeball with wings. In fact, may he, I'm sure he might've painted that himself, but uh, flying over this imaginary landscape uh, is typical of the, a, a very small intimate journey on the course of a watercolor that has all of the thrills of the really large nine foot canvas in the format the size of a, of a, of a card. And that's simply because the, the, the actual experience of making and discovering and articulating it and having it appear before one on, on the drawing board or on the easel is as, as exciting as it gets for, 
someone like me. So there are other things here as well. I wanted to show one of my favorite tools and I, I don't know how much time we have uh, for, uh, we wanna maintain some time for questions and answers, but I wanted to show a little bit about my actual time, practice. Time. We have You're time. Good. You're good. So uh, what I'm looking at right now is a, a subject that is to the restoration or the actual remanufacturing. This is kind of a strange topic, but to remanufacture a painting that was destroyed in one of the fires in the last couple of years in a collection. And I have a sketch of this uh, painting, which would, which is of a man reading a book or sleeping or having lunch leaning against an old tree stump. Um, so this is one of several sketches and, and it's about as detailed a sketch as I would want to make uh, jumping from this to a painting simply because one of the things I learned along the way as, a, as an artist was if I articulated, if I explored too much and finished too much the original drawing uh, for something, then it kind of felt like it was already done. Um, and it took energy away from the exploration that followed. So uh, I'll show you a miniaturized version of how the, this process will take place. And eventually this is gonna be quite a large painting. This is, this is just a small 18 by 22 uh, linen, which has been stretched on a wooden frame, sized with, um, my apologies to animal rights people, but it's sized with the traditional rabbit skin glue, uh, which is tightens the canvas and protects it. And then it's been coated with a, an oil ground and stained with a, a burned umber ground. And it has a little splatter on it from uh, a an evening of um, abandon when I was working on something else, but that's okay. It, it, it kind of adds to the character of what may happen. So on my easel, uh, my, my can the, the canvas ends up being on the easel. Uh, and the process of transferring the image usually happens in the beginning by taking this long dowel, which is now, I have to show it more closely because it, I think it's so beautiful. It's a, it's a dowel that has many, many layers of uh, paint and it is another geology of experience that is packed onto the tool. Anyway, this has uh, a hole drilled in the end which serves as a holder for charcoal or actually a brush handle. So the charcoal that's in there now will then be used to, to block out the subject. And I usually do that blocking out by a kind of dot to dot uh, coordinates method so what I'm doing here as I do this is I'm imagining this tree stump uh, that's taking shape somewhere in the picture space. And eventually uh, the dots will then be joined by, by lines uh, once those proportions seem to, to please me in a particular direction. Uh, uh, I've, I've already started to imagine, well, what is it that I'm painting? Uh, uh, I, all of the memories of wood and of, of rotting wood and, and grass start to emerge in this process. And uh, of course, this because it is uh, uh, brine charcoal, it can actually be wiped off really readily when I, when I need to, if I need to shrink or expand uh, or contract the, the image as it goes on. So from this, uh, the, the drawing may actually end up taking a, a, a day or so or two until I get something on, especially on a larger scale, that I, that I feel warrants the attack of painting it. And then that's usually sealed with something, a little spray of some kind, or um, uh, sometimes I'll just paint directly into the charcoal. Uh, but all of these methods and materials, which are so much a part of, or I sort of became defined as, especially as a teacher, by these the enthusiasms that I've had for these materials, uh, I can only attribute to the experience of seeing these great works of art in European museums, and by that I mean old masters and new masters. When I was 16 years old, I saw a, one of the major Max Beckmann retrospectives in the Haus der Kunst in Munich, and I was, I was completely blown away because I had never really seen anything quite as stunningly modern and abstracted, but yet was still representational. And I realized when I saw that, that I was not going to be an old master. After all, I was really going to be headed in another direction, one in which um, somehow more modern, more of the immediate ideas 
of the life that surrounded me were going to become my subject matter. And which I think has happened when I look at the, at the, all the works that are on display in Fresno, it is, it's, it's definitely um, a, a journey and a conversation that I've had with not only my, my life and times, but um, the history of art that I care about. And there are many, many references along the way, um, some, sometimes direct, sometimes indirect, to, to that, that, that deep affection that I have for, um, for the history of art. And I also, uh, bef before I forget to, to mention it, probably the most, uh, one, of the, one of the most important connections to have had over the years has been the opportunity to show work uh, that is being made in galleries and to actually have a, a, a real meaningful relationship with a gallery and an audience uh, that audience of which has be, has become in some cases collectors of my work that have allowed and helped support the whole crazy process that, that has happened and is now on display in the, in the museum. Those are those are gifts and, and of good fortune for me and the people that have helped uh, as gallerists along the way. Um, there, there, there are many and it has helped in my own way it has really helped to fuel not only um, in terms of the, the cost of working, uh, the, the financial cost of working, which is real. You, you know, one needs a space and one needs materials to work, but also at a, at a deeper level and a much more profound level, the belief in the possibility and, and belief in the value of what one is doing as a, whether you're a writer, a sculptor, a dancer, an artist, to have a community um, and it doesn't have to be an enormous community to help uh, make that happen. But I, I owe everything that I am, I owe to my family, um, my friends, the people that support, have, have helped support this project so far. And of all those people, I think Frances knows she is uh, kind of the center of the universe and is the, is the, the, the first line and critical eye that says yes or no. And I'm kind of working towards her high, her, her, her high level of, of perception and sensitivity to what's what's happening. She's been a great, a, a really great and essential partner in that uh, this whole project, all the way down the, the line. Um, can well, I Chester, can I ask you one thing to do? Can you yeah. show us the backs of your canvas? What you do to them, like you showed okay. us the other day? Yeah, I, you know, the one, the one, this large painting. I would turn it around, but I'm afraid I'll knock something over if I do that, because <laughs> it's hard to it's hard to turn around. Although, well, let me give it a shot. I'll I'll move my camera back, and uh, because it has a particularly nice back to it, uh, because of a, a canvas that's this big, it's going to have uh, a large amount of bare space in the back. Who needs to go to health clubs when you have to lift oh. <laughs> 50, 50 pound paintings on a regular basis? So, okay. Good job. So somewhere along the line, um, I got into the habit of, um, and maybe there, there's a whole other story attached to my own affection for literature. Uh, uh, I mean, I've used a lot of titles from poems as that were springboards for making paintings. And uh, I found that when I was finished with a painting, I would look at it and because oftentimes I don't, I really don't know why I'm doing this until it's finished. And then there's a certain kind of, the other side of the brain begins to kick in and you start to think, well, what could I say about this? And that's what leads to the charcoal hitting the linen here. And this, this painting, uh, so on the back of most, most of the paintings, there's the title, the year that it was made in Roman numerals, in this case, MMXI 2011, oil on linen 78 by 94. And on the, I'm not gonna read this whole thing, but the last little paragraph actually of this was written on the front of the painting, which is sometimes do, and again, because there's so much space on a large canvas, it seemed like a, something that was worth doing. And on this, I wrote, this is not wreckage. 
but the best informed response that I can shape to questions rampant and perpetual, children of reflection, joys of life's collection. May 1st, 2011. And then my little uh, Saul, Saul Steinbergian flourish of uh, circles, which I've used since I was uh, 19 years old, actually, uh, on and on. Chester uh, Arnold, kick, fetch it, he did it. Uh, <laughs> The only thing that I recall from my first year Latin class in high school, <laughs> <laughs> nonetheless, something that I love. So, and I think there, I've often thought that I'd like to make a book uh, of just of just the collections of the backs of paintings because I know uh, a couple of the paintings in the show, especially the last one um, of the brick wall with the hole in it, has a whole set of drawings on the back and some inscriptions and descriptions. Yeah. So um, it's another world. It's a, it's a, uh, a kind of the reintegration of the two brain halves to have writing and painting together. It's uh, maybe a little unusual, but I felt this is who I am. Why not do it? Uh, whether people want to read it or not is up to them. And that's why I like the QR codes at the museum. Uh, if you don't, uh, and because there is a whole realm of thinking in that visual art should be visual and literary work should be literary. And then never the twain shall meet. But I, I think that's as ridiculous as the whole idea that painting is dead, in that if you feel like doing something, people, do it. <laughs> Especially an artist, not as though you're, uh, you're an anarchist. Uh, it, it, this is such a peaceful profession to be able to feel free to write and do whatever you want on your canvas, front or back. It, is one of the remarkable freedoms. In fact, it may be the only freedom, true freedom that we really have um, in, in, a, in a working life. So I'm really grateful for <clears throat> having the, the opportunity to have the materials to do that and to have you ask me to show it to you. So uh, I appreciate that too. Fabulous. So, this, is, this has been really wonderfully informative. And I'm wondering if anyone, I think, You've mesmerized everyone. No one's put anything in the chat, but I'm yeah. sure some people might have some questions out there about you, if, your work. If they don't, I'll show you uh, one of my favorite things to do besides painting, uh, of which there are many distractions, is uh, <laughs> I, I was just cleaning out the pond. I have this little pond outside my studio this morning, and um, I, I routinely take some of the growth in the pond water and I put it in a microscope on my drawing table here. And I was looking at, I was looking at pond life and I found four different living forms in one little drop of water. I, I was so excited. It's like a child. Oh, there's, a, I saw a paramecium, two different types of little invisible worms, and then something that looked like a little water bear. Cool. Pretty, pretty remarkable, a little scary. And it's a reminder, do not drink pond water. Right. <laughs> The minutia of life. Yeah. So from the largest to the smallest, I feel like uh, um, something that uh, this is a topic for maybe everybody to think about, which I've been throwing out to people uh, a lot in conversation is how, how and why we are curious, end up being curious as human beings. And one, one of my friends, I had a friend, friend who's a, a neuropsychiatrist, uh, who said that, well, curiosity is a reward, uh, a, a reward, evolutionary reward for having been successful in being curious. So in other words, people, uh, as we develop, people who had a tendency to be curious uh, did, did well because they were able to catch more food, uh, find more berries or whatever, make, make more interesting and useful tools. Um, but the idea of curiosity is I think one of the greatest gifts one can foster in people of all ages. And I think the arts are particularly good at doing that because they present such a spectrum of information in different forms to, to enliven and excite the senses, all the senses, if we think about all of the arts and the curiosity that comes along with that is communicated from the makers because almost everybody that makes anything in an in, in art form or in science too, or literature anywhere is, is the result of a curious person opening a window and seeing another aspect of the world that hasn't been seen before. And, and that can lead of course to 
danger and disaster, but also to the greatest achievements I think that humankind has, has made. So here's to I curiosity. Have, I have a question, um, yeah. cause I have a hard stop at one, but um, you spoke about the neuro. Hi, my name is Rita. I'm new to Fresno Art Museum and to Fresno itself. Um, but I do visit the San Jose Museum of Art when I lived in San Jose. When you were um, putting the dots on the canvas, neurologically, I'm curious, are you already seeing an end result and you're starting with the dots and then connecting the lines or does, or do you put the dots and then it starts formulating in your mind and a picture? Or does it happen interchangeably? I think it, that's the, the latter is the, is the fact that it happens interchangeably because there, there is an initial uh, vision of some kind that starts to emerge in the, in the very, very rough skeletal sketch on the page, which is oftentimes very tiny, like a two inch by one inch square. Um, and in those little, what I call the kind of the bone structure of a composition begins to be inhabited by a particular uh, the vision of things. So it begins to look or feel like, oh, this could be a tree trunk, this could be a figure. And then as those things become clarified and more consciously imagined, then they begin to become shaped on the canvas. So the dots that are on, that, uh, that I begin to put on the canvas are, are really a way of beginning to explore almost like little molecules, the space that I'm imagining. Uh, so that where the distance is between the front of the of the imagined trunk and then the back, uh, it, because it happens really rapidly, I'd say within an hour of doing that, even on a large canvas, I would have a, a clearer idea of how big the, the, the main event was going to be in the format. And uh, the, then the rest is articulation and color and so forth. But yeah, yeah, it's a, and it's a process that I, I feel that there is there are endorphins that are released in the process of making that happen where uh, out of nothing appears something. That's a really, it feels very magical. I'm sure it could be reduced to neurochemistry, but uh, the, the, nonetheless is still a miraculous and exciting process to, to be involved with. And here I am 50 years on feeling excited and getting, uh, thinking about, I, I can't wait till this is over so I start painting again. <laughs> it's rather embarrassing, but it's true. Yeah. We understand. Cindy has a question, Susan, in the chat. I, I see that. It just showed mm -hmm. up. Um, someone asked if uh, you had a connection to Fresno or the museum from the past, I assume. You obviously have one now. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I think uh, not really. Well, the reason why I got in touch with, with uh, um, Michelle originally was because of my friend and a colleague from graduate school, uh, Heather Wilcoxon, who had a show a few years ago now, three years ago, maybe. Mm -hmm. And I guess I had seen Heather, I see her pretty on and off through the years. She said, oh, um, I was talking to Michelle Pracy and she said, she liked your work, she'd love to give you a show. And I thought, well, yeah, I, maybe I should call her. So, and I think that was the connection through Heather because she had had this wonderful experience showing there. And I thought, well, I'll, I'll, I'll send her. I'll send Michelle an email and of course uh, the rest is history. She was very eager to and got back to me really quickly. Uh, even though it's taken maybe three years for this to actually come to fruition completely. Thank you. Great. Oh, let me see, is that a question? I think it's thank a thank you so much. I will be following your work. Oh, someone had to log off. <laughs> so uh, are there any other questions? Okay, Chester, Chester, I think this Chester is will be available at the reception on March 25th and the artist curator talk start at five and then he will be available throughout the six to eight o'clock p.m. reception to answer questions and meet you and talk to you. So that'll be our next chance to be with Chester that I know of. We're going to schedule him for a lecture sometime within the period of the show. We just haven't nailed down a date yet. And I, we thank everyone for joining us. I realize I, I never introduced myself. I'm actually Susan Philgate and I'm the education director here. And it's been a pleasure to organize this studio tour for Chester. 
I think it's you're totally great. enthralled with your work. It's fabulous, and and the children are loving it. That that pleases me greatly. Yeah. <laughs> it's wonderful. well, the, you know the the there's the old saying that you don't uh, you you don't stop playing because you grow old. You grow old because you stop playing. And uh, I've never stopped playing, although I do appear on the outside to be getting older. <laughs> I, I, I still feel like the same enthusiast that I was when I started at the age of 19. So thank you again for allowing me to uh, put together a spectrum for, for myself and my own family to see as well, because a lot of my, my daughters have not, I, I, they're come, going to be coming to the reception. And they, a, lot, a lot of the paintings I don't think they've seen or they've they were done and they were gone when they were quite small. So um, it'll be really interesting to share with them too. So I, I really am grateful for that. Great. Looks like there's one more question. Oh, ah, is art your only support or do you have a job that supports you? What? Uh, well, that's a, that actually is a very good question because, uh, and if I can create a little more, I mean, an expanded answer is a very important aspect of of an artist's life is how do you support yourself? Uh, in some cases, you find a, a wealthy spouse <laughs> to help. No, that, that didn't happen. So I, I started out I, for 20 years, believe it or not, I was working seven days a week as a chronicle delivery driver. Um, and, and I was working for about two to three hours every morning, seven days a week. And uh, without much vacation time, because it was difficult to find somebody to replace um, I had a route that involved 600 deliveries. In fact, I calculated that I delivered over 4 million newspapers in the time that I did that job. But that gave me uh, enough money to live on through all those years that then allowed um, me to paint all day or as long as I could until I collapsed and had to fall asleep to get up the next morning. So that was, a, that was an excellent way to do it. And a, and a number of other artists, my good friend Pierre Flandreau as well, was one of those cohorts. We, we lived across the street from each other. We went down to do the route. We supported ourselves that way. After having children and uh, getting involved in a mortgage, um, all those things kind of happened at the same time that I graduated from the Art Institute and I ended up getting a teaching job, which helped subsidize everything up until uh, I retired four years ago. So the answer is now I don't have a job, I have a pension. And I've never been happier. <laughs> I, I wake up in the morning and all I have to do is, you know, either cut the grass in the backyard or uh, go into the studio and paint. My God, <laughs> what could be better? It's, it's, you know, it's a good life. It's, it is a, it's worked out well for me. But I, I would say that that's one of the greatest challenges one has uh, as a painter too. How do you, how do you sustain, how do you support the enthusiasm that you have for what you're doing uh, without being uh, diminished by the, the realities of working life. Um, some of that's attitude, but also it's a matter of being uh, imaginative enough to find a situation that works best. And sometimes that may mean living in a place like uh, Pueblo, Colorado, where real estate is a 10th of the price, or it could be just uh, doing some uh, a strange but lucrative night job. Another some other questions have appeared. Uh, is the studio always a friendly place for you, Chester? Um, the, the studio is my happy place, so to speak. It's <laughs> uh, the only the only time that it's maybe not is when it's and, and you're seeing it now when you can actually walk across the room. Uh, there are times when and I'll be honest, and Francis knows this all too well. She'll open the door and look in and she'll just shake her head. She says, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know how you do it. <laughs> because yeah, that's the only time I think, you know, they, sometimes it gets to the point where there's so much has been going on uninterruptedly that things are piled up. And then I have to really dial it back and clean the place up and get it cleared up again. But that's the only complaint I would have about. And it's not really a complaint. It's just a uh, part of daily function of life, really, keeping things clean and orderly to some and degree. The last question that just appeared is, do you have a regular gallery where you show and you sell through? Uh, yes, in fact, um, in San Francisco, uh, I show with Catherine Clark Gallery, and Catherine Clark is going to be putting up a mini, mini retrospective at her gallery opening uh, in the first week of March. Uh, so we, we're select, making selections for that this next week. Uh, so it will run parallel to at least during the month of March and April, I believe, 
to the to the show in Fresno. Uh, and I'm just uh, on Wednesday. I'm heading up to uh, Portland because I have a small show in a gallery up there at the Elizabeth Leach Gallery, which is almost over, but uh, it, it's a, a fairly small show of um, paintings of marine disasters and waves. Kind of kind of exciting what uh, paintings paintings of stormy seas which are i've i've been talking about that a lot they're kind of metaphors for the instability of everything but um, at the same time it's just wonderful to push a lot of blue and white paint around <laughs> so that's up in uh, portland at elizabeth leach gallery yeah. okay thank you i don't see any more questions coming through in the chat so if, if no one has any more you, well, if you do have more, you'll have to save them for when Chester is with us uh, on our at our reception in March. And we are producing a catalog for this exhibition, which I forgot to mention earlier. And Chester and I are hoping and praying it'll be available uh, the night of the 25th. So you could take away um, the exhibition in your pocket, a little bit bigger than pocket, but it will, it is comprehensive. Good. I'll tell you, uh, can I say one last little story? Yes, Absolutely. The first catalog that I had made um, was for a show at the DSSA Museum in the University of Santa Clara. And it was designed by a friend, a friend and a great, a great designer, Jack Stoffaker of Greenwood Press. Um, and it, it was made, and I was having a, an opening of a simultaneous opening of a, an exhibit in Mill Valley at Susan Cummins Gallery. And the catalog was late. It was late. It was didn't seem like it was going to appear. The night of the opening, they just opened the bottle of champagne, and a FedEx truck drove up, and the boxes of catalogs were coming in on rollers. Everybody, hey, the catalog made it just just in the nick of time. Yeah, it was hilarious. But that's the kind of nail biting you don't want to have to go through. If yeah, you can possibly avoid it. So, but it's a uh, and in fact. Uh, this catalog, uh, let me also say this, this catalog I've written in a, in the acknowledgments is the catalog itself. I've, I've dedicated my contribution to it, to the memory of Kenneth Baker, who passed away this last year and, and who wrote the very first essay in uh, that catalog that came at the last minute that I just described. And I reread that essay uh, and I got tears in my eyes because it's so beautifully written. Um, and I was really honored to have that association with him. Great man. Well, thank you, Chester. It's been a delightful noon thank hour. You. And we look forward to seeing you next month. And yes. we'll have you down again. So thank you so much for your uh, impact on our lives. Thank well, you. Well, thank you. Hopefully it's positive. <laughs> thank, thank you. It's wonderful. Thanks. All right. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Okay. Bye-bye, everyone. <laughs>